The Center for Excellence in Citizenship at La Jolla Country Day School presents Life, Love, and Loss, a book discussion with Dr. Lucy Kalanithi, contributor to When Breath Becomes Air, and Dan Norland, contributor to Witnesses of the Unseen, Seven Years in Guantanamo. In Witnesses of the Unseen, Lakta Bimidien and Mustafa Idir recount their struggles to establish their innocence and return to their wives and children in the face of an inhumane imprisonment that meant they did not know when, or if, their lives would resume. His name is Lakhdar Boumediene. He may be best known for the Supreme Court case Boumediene versus Bush, in which the Supreme Court ruled that detainees have the right to challenge the reason that they are being detained. A Republican-appointed judge ordered him released last November, saying there was not enough credible evidence to hold him. And he's now a free man, and his story is quite troubling. After what he describes as a seven-and-a-half-year-long nightmare, Lakhdar Boumediene is now a free man. In 2001, he, his wife, and two daughters lived in Sarajevo, Bosnia. He worked for a charity helping orphans and others in need. But five weeks after 9-11, Boumediene was arrested by Bosnian police and charged with conspiring to blow up the U.S. and British embassies, a charge he calls false and ludicrous. They searched my car, my office, nothing, my cell phone, nothing, nothing, nothing. Never, never, I, never, I... I think about this stuff. The Bosnia courts were about to free Boumediene when in January 2002, the U.S. military shackled him and flew him to Guantanamo Bay. He thought the U.S. would clear him. Maybe one week, two weeks, they know I am innocent. I, I come back to, 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 to my home. But in Guantanamo, Boumediene says he was kept awake for 16 days straight and repeatedly physically abused. Do you think that you were tortured? I don't think. I'm sure. You think this is not torture? What's this? What you can call this? He went on a hunger strike and was force-fed. When you were there, did you want to die? No. I don't like to die because uh, every day I, I think about my wife and my daughters. But last year, Boumediene's attorneys beat the Bush administration in the Supreme Court for the right to challenge his detention in court. And a judge appointed by Bush then ruled the evidence against Boumediene was weak, and he ordered his release. Two court victories against President Bush. Boumediene made a t-shirt. And last month, he was reunited with his family. He asked us not to film them for security reasons. I just, I cry. Just, I cry because I don't know, my daughters. Boumediene says he understands how the 9-11 attacks prompted strong reactions from the U.S., but only to a degree. I will agree with you, with you, but for one month, two months, but not for uh, more than seven years. Comes air, Dr. Paul Kalanithi and Dr. Lucy Kalanithi reflect on their quest to discover what gives life meaning in the face of a disease that meant they did not know how soon his life would end. We have a sad and beautiful story now about a father's gift to his daughter. Uh, in the New York Times bestselling memoir, When Breath Becomes Air, Dr. Paul Kalanithi shares the transformational power of giving life as he comes to term with his own mortality. Yahoo's chief global anchor, Katie Couric, has his story. Paul Kalanithi was the modern definition of a Renaissance man. He majored in English and biology at Stanford and went on to earn master's degrees in both English literature and philosophy before heading to Yale. We met as first year medical students and at first I thought he was like this boring guy who wanted to be a doctor and he was really serious and then I realized that on his medical school ID he was wearing a fake mustache and so that was when I first had a crush on him. Paul continued his medical career becoming a neurosurgeon at Stanford 
where his wife Lucy is an internist. Their lives and careers were soaring, but at 36, Paul got some devastating news. Although he never smoked, he was diagnosed with lung cancer, stage four. We had seen that bad things can happen. Um, you know, when you're a doctor, you see that day in and day out. And we sort of had this feeling of, oh my gosh, it's our turn now. How did cancer change your relationship? After he got diagnosed, I said, what do you need from me? Do you want to travel with your brothers? Do you want me to help you accomplish something that doesn't include me? And for him to essentially say, no, I want to be with you in our house. I want to go back to our honeymoon destination. I want to spend my whole life with you. When we knew it might mean a year or two was so romantic and amazing. Paul wanted to chronicle his final days in a memoir called When Breath Becomes Air, now a New York Times bestseller. But that wasn't the only legacy he would leave behind. He and Lucy decided to have a baby. I asked him, you know, don't you think that having a child to say goodbye to will make your death more painful. And his answer really astounded me. He said, well, wouldn't it be great if it did? And what he meant by that was, if a child brings us such a degree of meaning that it becomes even more painful um, to leave, um, Better to have experienced amazing. that yeah. meaning yeah. and that level of love. Yeah, and then when she was born, we were so thrilled. And his book title is When Breath Becomes Air, and I kind of look back and I think for her, that was the moment when air became breath. There is perhaps only one thing to say to this infant who is all future, overlapping briefly with me, whose life, barring the improbable, is all but past. That message is simple. You filled a dying man's days with a sated joy, a joy unknown to me in all my prior years, a joy that does not hunger for more and more, but rests satisfied in, in this, this time, time right, right now. now. That is an enormous thing. What follows, country day teacher Dan Norland and Dr. Lucy Kalanithi discuss witnesses of the unseen and when breath becomes air. In both books, we see that people are capable of more than they ever thought possible, that immense suffering can be met with immense love, and that there is an immeasurable, inextinguishable light in our children. Hi everyone. So thank you very much for coming out tonight and thank you very much Dan and Lucy for agreeing to be up here speaking, giving a brief story for us. Um, we're, the way we envision this would be that Dan would give a quick summary or talk about a few things, Lucy would do the same, and then we would kind of start off with a couple of questions and answers. I have some things that I've been working on and then from there we'll open it up to the audience and just have like a very informal session, just questions and answers about either the book, about what our perspectives are on their works or any questions that we have for them. So for that, I'll start off by asking Dan to speak a bit about his book. So the, the first thing I'll say, um, you know, I'm here all the time and happy to talk with any of you about witnesses uh, if, if you're interested at, at any point. I, I wanna make sure I leave plenty of time for uh, Lucy to, to speak, uh, to speak about When Breath Becomes Air, which I, I had the privilege of reading just earlier this week, and, and it's, if you haven't read it, you really should. It's such a powerful, moving uh, story and, and beautifully written. Um, but so I'm, I'm, we'll keep this brief. Um, it was an honor for me to get to work with Lothar and Mustafa to help them share their story of what they went through. It's a story a lot of, a lot of people don't pay attention to. Uh, it's so much easier to look away, uh, but I think it's, it's worth it not to, uh, to, to pay enough attention to make sure that we, we don't do something like this again. Uh, that you know, there, There's a debate to be had around Guantanamo and whether we should have a place like Guantanamo. And, and uh, there's, there's, I mean, I have pretty strong opinions on that, but there's a legitimate debate to be had. Uh, but I think no matter what your political views, there's, there's no question if we're going to put people in a place like Guantanamo, we really need to give them a chance to argue their innocence, to argue that they don't belong there. 
Um, Lakhtar and Mustafa, when they appeared in court and argued before a judge that they were not enemy combatants, that they did not belong in Guantanamo, and he reviewed the evidence, they were released. Uh, essentially, he heard the case and a few weeks later ordered their release. Uh, the, the time between when they got their case before a judge and, and when they were freed was a matter of weeks. Uh, it's just that it took them six years just to get to a judge. And it took them six years and a trip to the Supreme Court and a successful Supreme Court appeal uh, to get to a judge. Uh, and I think the fact that we let that happen, uh, that we made that happen, is something that, especially once you get to know these men and, and talk with them about their experience and their lives, um, you know, I think it's, it's, sometimes it's easy to forget that, that these are real human beings. Um, and so my, my goal uh, in working with them, that they wanted to share their story with an American audience. Um, my sister speaks fluent Arabic with me, and we traveled to France, traveled to Bosnia to interview Lakhtar and Mustafa, uh, and then sort of took, took their accounts and shaped them into this book. And, um, you know, I think their stories are powerful. Uh, and I, I hope you'll read them. I hope if you have questions, you'll talk to me about them. Um, but I also hope that I don't ramble so much that you don't get to hear from uh, from Lucy. So I'm going to stop talking now. Um, but th thanks a lot for being here and for, for paying attention to this story. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, we're going to turn it over to Lucy for a bit, and then we'll start off with some Q&As from there. So the floor is all yours. Um, thanks for having me. So I was thinking I might just read a little bit of Paul's writing kind of as an intro. And um, it's funny because, Dan, as you were talking and thinking about um, Lockdown and Mustafa, too, I think, you know, Paul's, Paul wrote this book um, after he was diagnosed with terminal cancer as a young neurosurgeon, and he's obviously writing about mortality um, from the perspectives of being a physician and a patient, but I think just as much as Paul's writing is about mortality, it's also about identity and sort of what happens to you when what you thought you were and who you thought you would be sort of dissolves. And so it's interesting to think about that in the context of these men who suddenly um, their lives are totally upended. I think they probably thought their lives were over at many points. And um, so I think that's sort of interesting is how do we um, persevere? How do we reshape um, who we are in the context of these real upheavals? And um, so I'm, if it's OK, I'm just going to read um, a little bit from the prologue of um, When Breath Becomes Air, where Paul's writing about the moment of being diagnosed and um, you can hear him like, in the these in that moment uh, wrestling with um, not only his mortality but with who he is. I flipped through the CT scan images. The diagnosis obvious: the lungs were matted with innumerable tumors, the spine deformed, a full lobe of the liver obliterated, cancer widely disseminated. I was a neurosurgical resident entering my final year of training. Over the last six years, I'd examined scores of such scans on the off chance that some procedure might benefit the patient. But this scan was different. It was my own. I had received the plastic arm bracelet all patients wear, put on the familiar light blue hospital gown, walked past the nurses I knew by name, and was checked into a room, the same room where I had seen hundreds of patients over the years. In this room, I had sat with patients and explained terminal diagnoses and complex operations. In this room, I had congratulated patients on being cured of a disease. In this room, I had pronounced patients dead. I had sat in the chairs, washed my hands in the sink, scrawled instructions on the marker board, changed the calendar. I had even, in moments of utter exhaustion, longed to lie down in this bed and sleep. Now I lay there wide awake. A young nurse, one I hadn't met, poked her head in. The doctor will be in soon. 
And with that, the future I had imagined, the one just about to be realized, the culmination of decades of striving evaporated. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so one of the biggest um, thought-provoking elements of this entire story when I read it um, was definitely how Paul had that nice mix of being both the patient but also going back into the operating room. I thought that was very, very interesting where when someone is diagnosed with terminal cancer, instead of saying, you had mentioned this in an interview, do you want to travel the world with your brothers? Do you want to go do something else? His response was, no, I genuinely want to go back into the operating room and go back into that world to have a meaningful experience. So just to start off a little bit, I was hoping maybe you could comment on that and how we're all very fortunate to be here with you and the family today, but most of us have never met Paul in person. Um, we can read his stories and it's there, but that just goes to show his entire character. and. Maybe if there's a story on that of something that isn't in the books or memoirs that would allow us to all really appreciate some other aspects of Paul that we haven't met yet. Um, what do you think, guys? Um, and yeah. feel free if um, you have stories and topics as well, if you want to share, uh, more than welcome to just have you come on stage as well. This is definitely very informal, very open. So you're more than welcome to come join at any point to give a story about your brother, see the highs and lows, if there's a nice sibling story amongst the three of you that you want to share, very open to hearing that perspective as well. Um, I mean, I think it is a big deal, right, to, um, I think a lot of people, if they were diagnosed with terminal cancer and given an uncertain future, a much limited um, uh, time than they thought they would, I think a lot of people would like quit their jobs immediately, right? Like toss their desk over and like never come back to the office again. And so I think it's, um, it was interesting that Paul chose to go back. I think it's like a real commitment and a kind of a big deal to, to say like, yes, I would choose these same things um, in the spite of that, um, in spite of that limited time. Um, and I think some of it had to do with the identity too, right? Like Paul was diagnosed um, with cancer and he lived for 22 months after the diagnosis. And in the final year of his life, he was working furiously on writing the manuscript for When Breath Becomes Air, which happened really serendipitously after he wrote an essay in the New York Times that went viral and then secured a book deal. But he sort of reshaped his whole identity um, into becoming a writer. Um, but that took a while too. I think some of it was like he needed some solid ground. So he had that um, in neurosurgery. But I think it was much more than that, like you said, which was um, he had made really considered decisions about his life and what he meant to do with his time and what he thought was meaningful, which I think a lot of us are trying to do all the time, right? So, um, but it's a real testament to that when um, you stand on those decisions, even when things get really shaky. Um, and I think the kind of doctor that he was changed a little bit too, which was kind of interesting to see. Um, Paul was really um, very interested in um, helping people parse through the um, difficult, thorny aspects of illness. Like he did not see his job as a physician as merely technical at all. And I think he even writes in the book, um, you know, technical excellence was not enough. Um, uh, and um, but even so, after he went back to work as a patient, he said um, he sort of expanded the amount of time that he would spend with patients talking about what their treatments or their diseases would actually feel like, like what the experiential landscape of that would be, um, uh, which was kind of interesting. I think, I think as a patient, he sort of understood um, how important not only the big questions are, but um, like the day-to-day -day of what you can really be expecting for you and your family. I don't know. Dan, do you have any follow-up questions? You know, the, the, I've said this already, but the book is so moving and powerful. Um, and I guess one, one question I had, you know, I, I thought the, the epilogue as well was really powerful. Um, and, and I was curious to hear a bit more just about sort of how you decided what stories to focus on and, and uh, you know, what, what story to tell there. 
Sure. Um, thanks for asking. Uh, so when Paul died, the manuscript for his memoir, um, there was sort of more that he could have written. He was like working on it very um, devotedly uh, the whole time and enduring a lot of um, um, physical discomfort even to be writing. Um, but he was really um, uh, tough and devoted um, to it. And after he died, Random House, uh, who's the publisher, asked me whether I would write an epilogue to the book, and it felt actually really strange. Um, I hadn't considered it at all, obviously. I mean, it completely wasn't the plan for what was going to happen with the manuscript. Um, and I don't think of myself as a writer at all, and I don't enjoy writing in the way that Paul really seemed to enjoy writing. But I think I'm just going to interrupt to say that read the epilogue, and you should think of yourself as a writer. Um, but yeah. sorry, I'll, I'll stop interrupting you. Thank you. Um, uh, but I think part of what I talked to, so the epilogue to the book describes um, the day that Paul died and um, what happened when Paul died, and then um, reflects on Paul as a person and as a um, you know patient and a physician and a dad uh, and a family member, and then talks about kind of what's been happening since Paul died. So um, it describes um, going to visit the grave where Paul's buried and um, a little bit about our daughter, and um, so to talk about those things and reflect, um, including on grief, um, does feel like it's part of the story of what has happened to our family. So um, I, in the end, I feel really glad that I got to write an epilogue, even though um, at the time it felt, I mean, nothing felt good, but um, uh, it felt uh, kind of strange, but ended up feeling right. So the book was released January 2016, so we're looking at about 18 months. Um, one thing that I was really uh, struck by, you've been doing hundreds of different book talks and just interviews, Katie Couric has mentioned, NPR, TED Talks as well. What has been the biggest surprise that you've come across with the people that you're interacting with or just in general with this entire, like, I'm sure there was never a point where you're like, but where Paul was like, I want this book to go viral and I want it to be, on Obama's night shelf. I wanted to be that Bill Gates is commenting is on. Is it on Obama? <laughs> I read that Can somewhere. Did that happen? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what has been your biggest surprise with all this that it, in this entire realm after the book went out? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the biggest surprise overall has just been the um, teeth that the book has. Like, it's been we've all been incredibly ambivalent about it. Ambivalent is the wrong word, but it's been extremely bittersweet um, to have this happen after Paul died, but then also to see Paul like enter part of a literary canon, you know? Like, um, and I think Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, made space for Paul. I really feel like Paul, there's sort of a cultural moment that Paul's book hit um, in thinking about mortality specifically, but um, yeah, I think Paul, as you, for people who've read the book, you can see what a lover of literature Paul was and the fact that he, sometimes it's just literary illusions that it kind of drives me crazy because I'll be reading it and be like, oh, that's like a, that's a reference to, you know, Socrates or whatever, and you're just, and, but he doesn't even cite it. It's just sort of like making these illusions and I catch them later. Um, or the, the two sections of the book, there aren't chapters, but the sections of the book are called um, In Perfect Health Begin that Paul writes up until the moment of diagnosis. The second section is called Cease Not Till Death. And those are um, paraphrased from Walt Whitman's poem, Song of Myself. And I didn't even know that until after Paul died and was like, ah, oh, Whitman, of course it is. And anyway, you can see how much of a lover of literature Paul was. And um, he's, he, um, he said at one point, he's like, I think poetry is more comforting than scripture. Like literature and poetry were incredibly deeply um, comforting to him and important to him. And so to see him grow up um, posthumously into this class of writers um, and enter the canon, is that's the thing that feels most like viscerally and wonderfully surprising to me um, while also being bittersweet. And then I also just think like people's kindness is very surprising. I mean, like I'm not a cynical person, so I don't mean it that way. I just mean um, like when I'm going around talking, um, people are so kind to come up to me and tell me their stories or to tell me 
how Paul's writing affected them or to, you know, be included in an event like this where we're meeting people. And um, I think that at a time when, for me, I felt so lonely and sad, um, to f like be pulled back into the world has been really wonderful too. Are there any questions in the audience? That I'm an immigration lawyer and my name's Valerie. Um, I have a question for Dan. Most people have only heard of Guantanamo, and since you had a lot of opportunity to talk to the two gentlemen, um, probably for everyone here, could you kind of explain what their life was like on a daily basis in prison in Guantanamo? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because, you know, it, in some ways, there, there are these big moments, right? These. The, there's Mustafa's account of you know when guards sort of essentially beat him senseless um, because he he had the audacity to refuse to turn over his pants um, during a during a search of the cells. Um, you know, th there are and, and there are a number of moments like that. Uh, you know, I think Guantanamo was a place where is a place where. People are treated um, in, in large ways that are kind of horrific. But I think, you know, to hear Lothar and Mustafa talk about it, at least, you know, even more than that, was the, the sort of day in, day out, uh, sort of death by a thousand paper cuts, you know, the, the small indignities, the, uh, the inability to communicate with their families. That, that not knowing, not having a sense, you know, might I go home in a year? Might I, might I never go home? Um, you know, wondering about their kids growing up without them. Um, you know, I think obviously no, no prison is a fun place to be, but I think the isolation of Guantanamo, the, the sort of putting people in this place where they're completely shut off from the rest of the world, um, you know, I think it's, it's something maybe we don't, we don't think about enough. Thank you, Dan, for sharing, and thank you, Valerie, for the question. Yeah. Sugar Adas, I'm a country day parent. Um, this question for Dan. Uh, now that uh, Lagdar and Mustafa's identities are have been revealed, and they are trying to rebuild their lives in Nice and Sarajevo, do you consider that that might this book might put them at a disadvantage uh, in because they are still in the in Europe, and there is a lot of uh, concerns about uh, people from the Middle East and North Africa uh, as being embedded terrorists or may have been um, radicalized uh, in the past. Do you think that they, uh, this book might put them in a difficult path to recovery? I mean, it, that was something we, we thought about and talked with them about. You know, I think in a, in an odd way, it's actually helpful to them to, to sort of have their story, you know, because whether they have this book out there or not, they are former Guantanamo detainees. Uh, and there's really no, you know, there's no way around that. Uh, but, you know, here they, they sort of share their side of the story and explain how it was just a, what a mistake it was. And um, I actually was recently talking with uh, with Kate, the, the translator, um, who spoke with Lakhdar recently. And the, the small town outside of Nice that he lives in, uh, the, the mayor uh, of, of Cairo is, uh, is currently reading this book. Uh, Kate, Kate said that he has an English translator who reads 10 pages of it a day to him. So hopefully he'll be, he'll be finishing it soon. Um, but he said, you know, he, he often kind of wondered about Lockdar because he, he keeps to himself and, and a lot of people didn't really know him. Um, and of course there is in, in France, understandably, there's, there's fear. Um, and, and he said that this sort of gave him a better sense, that the mayor said that this gave him a better sense of who Lockdar was and, and why he kind of kept to himself. Um, you know, and, and so my hope is that in some ways for them having their story out there uh, will actually be, be helpful. Um, you know, my, my response, a, a couple times I've come across comments 
uh, online, you know, to, to the effect of basically, you know, everyone in Guantanamo is guilty. Uh, you know, it's some some more hateful comments than that. Um, and, and my response has always been, look, read their story. And if you still think they're guilty, you know, then let's have a conversation. Um, and I, I've, even, I've even said, if you read their story and you still think they're guilty, I will pay you back for the book. Um, and no one has taken me up on that offer. But it turns out internet trolls don't, they, you know, alas. Um, but, uh, but I think that them having the story out there You know, is is in that sense helpful? They they get to explain who they are. Uh, yeah, that's that's my hope. Anyways, um, also, you, you guys got to stop asking me questions. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm happy to answer them, but I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really curious about what happened when they went home and went to their families, because obviously the families also don't know if they're going to come back and they're dealing with the whole thing on the other side, right? Yeah, I think in, in some ways that was the, the sort of the most heartbreaking and heartwarming aspect of their story to me was you know, being away from their families and then reuniting with the family. The, the moments where they, where the families are reunited, I think are, are among the most powerful parts of their stories. Um, you know, in Lakhtar's case, you know, he's, he's coming off a plane and you know, his, his wife and daughters are there waiting for him um, and don't you know, don't recognize him uh, because they were really young when he was when he was taken to Guantanamo um, and he also he was on a hunger strike for for a couple of years while in Guantanamo so he came out you know, 60 70 pounds lighter um, I mean it's it, it's worth looking at a picture of Lakhdar and Mustafa while they were in Guantanamo and comparing it to a more recent picture. Um, but it's, it's pretty striking. Um, but so, you know, Lakhdar's daughter at one point says to, to her mom, you know, I don't recognize this man. Um, you know, and and uh, Mustafa talks about as, as the police car is pulling up the driveway to his home, uh, his sons are sort of running behind the car. Um, and that, that image has sort of stuck with me since, since hearing it. Um, you know, I think, uh, along those lines, the, the sort of the part where, you know, how do you tell your kids, right? Uh, there was a while where Lakhtar and Mustafa, you know, they were on a business trip. Uh, and then at a certain point, Mustafa's older son uh, found out that his father was in Guantanamo because uh, other kids at school started teasing him about it. Um, and so, you know, that, that I think is part of the story that, that we don't necessarily think about when we think about what happens to people in, in Guantanamo. When we think about Guantanamo, I don't think we often think about the, the families and the effect that that has on them. But really, you have an opportunity to, to ask uh, questions of, of this amazing individual, and, and you should. Okay. I have a question. Um, Walter Atta, this question is for Lucy. Um, so, when, you can answer this as well, please. Um, with yourself and Paul being a healthcare provider, how do you think he would have responded to the uh, question of being sympathetic towards your patient, being empathetic towards your patient? And if being empathetic towards your patient would actually cripple a, a healthcare provider from doing their job, because now you're immersing yourself in you know that patient, saying, "Hey, I'm actually being able to put myself in your situation." Sure. So I'm going to see if I can find a little piece that I can read. Um, and the question is about like that idea. You didn't say it, but the idea of like professional detachment. So when you're a healthcare provider. Um, what does it mean to sympathize with your patients? Can you empathize with them? Um, what's going to help them? What's going to help you? Uh, I just want to find a tiny piece, if that's OK.
Okay, so this is Paul um, partly talking about why he loves uh, neuro why he loved neurosurgery. And I think the answer to your question, I think, is partly tied up in this. And it's, this is another time where it's like, it's very hard for me to answer it on behalf of Paul. You know, I think that the answer is really complicated in some ways. Um, and I wish that he could talk to you about it. Um, but here's a piece of what he wrote. Uh, While all doctors treat diseases, neurosurgeons work in the crucible of identity. Paul was kind of a neurosurgical exceptionalist. Every operation on the brain is, by necessity, a manipulation of the substance of ourselves. And every conversation with a patient undergoing brain surgery cannot help but confront this fact. In addition to the patient and family, the brain surgery is usually the most dramatic event they've ever faced, and as such has the impact of any major life event. At those critical junctures, the question is not simply whether to live or die, but what kind of life is worth living. Would you trade your ability or your mother's to talk for a few extra months of mute life? Would you trade the expansion of your visual blind spot in exchange for eliminating the small possibility of a fatal brain hemorrhage? Would you trade your right hand's function to stop seizures? How much neurologic suffering would you let your child endure before saying that death is preferable? Because the brain mediates our experience of the world, any neurosurgical problem forces a patient and family, ideally with a doctor as a guide, to answer this question. What makes life meaningful enough to go on living? And I guess I think Paul's answer is kind of tied up in this, which is like the questions that his patients were facing were so deeply complicated and personal, and his decision about whether and how to operate on somebody was so tied up in who that person was and what they understood and who they were and wanted to be. Um, and I think that is um, sort of like empathy by definition in a way, um, to feel like you must um, know your patient in order to navigate their care with them. So. Um, uh, I think if Paul had to land on the side of the empathy versus sympathy debate, I think he would land on the empathy side. And empathy is kind of like an overused word, sort of like hashtag empathy. It's like, it doesn't, it's a loaded word now um, in a way that maybe it shouldn't be. Um, uh, and I think that um, there is that real tension in medicine. Like there's all these reasons that healthcare providers burn out. Um, and it's, I was talking to, um, one of Paul's friends the other day about like how I think somebody asked him, somebody who wasn't practicing medicine and asked like, well, isn't it so hard to do this job and you witness suffering and um, you know, it's a, it's very hard to have to engage with people and all these things. And the friend was like, no, all the other stuff is hard. Like the paperwork is hard and the, you know, the hours are hard and all these various things are hard and that other stuff is suffering and the um, being a witness to other people. That's actually the reason people stay. Um, is to do that work. So, um, yeah, and I think that's the, um, yeah, for me, I think, you know, a lot of what Paul's talking about in his writing and um, what I've been talking about um, since is the idea that, um, you know, pain and suffering are a part of all of our lives together. And um, if you can sort of incorporate them into your life um, rather than ignoring them or pushing them away, I think um, you actually sort of end up um, more resilient, uh, which is kind of surprising uh, in a way. Any other questions, Richard? Right. This is from uh, Yuma. I'm at the University of Arizona now. When he asked his oncologist about the kaplan myers survival curves and she refused to tell him, what are your thoughts on that, I guess, at the time and now if that has changed? Um, so at the Right when Paul got diagnosed, um, he met his oncologist and said, well, great, I look forward to talking about the Kaplan-Meier curves. And those are basically sort of statistical graphs that demonstrate for a given disease how many people with that disease remain alive at a certain point in time. So um, uh, the, the x-axis is time. Um, and then the, depending on the disease, you know, the line looks like whatever it looks like. And, she said, well, we're not going to talk about that. Um, and later I talked to her about it, and um, she said she knew we already knew, which is totally true. I think a lot of people 
um, with a given disease, you know, there's so much on the internet and there's all this hearsay and there's various things and it's like she knew, we knew exactly where to find out that information and I think she kind of wanted to flip it around to a different conversation which is um, how can I help you live your life the way you want to and I think um, Paul and I actually when he was first diagnosed, I think based on what we knew about stage four lung cancer from being medical students 10 years prior, I think we thought he might even die that same year. Like, I think we are, she actually brought our expectations like somewhere better than they were. And I think, um, especially with the novel therapies, um, there's so much uncertainty now, which is great, but really disorienting about um, the promise of cancer research these days. So I think ultimately what she did for him was she really brought him back to life. I mean, it was, and she did prognosticate a few key times during the, um, along the way, including when Paul was really sick. Um, but I think the key for what she was doing was she knew us and she knew our training and somehow she intuited w what was gonna help Paul. Cause I think it actually was incredibly helpful for him that she wasn't just dwelling on the medical piece of it, that she was talking about um, these bigger questions about what his goals were and things like that. Um, and I was going to say one other thing about it. Um, oh yeah, just that it deepened my understanding of, um, or my like visceral sense of the relationship between a patient and physician. Because I think, um, especially for a person who's like a young, um, very, you know, um, like, like a young, confident neurosurgeon, um, to then become a patient and have this real love for his oncologist and like real kind of like dependence on his oncologist in a way that you would expect but not necessarily from everybody. Like to see him feel that real attachment to her was like really meaningful and um, cool, I think. And I think she could sense that too. Uh, one more question over here. Here's Boris Gitas, I'm a friend of the Doss family. Um, you both have such vastly different stories to tell and um, it's, a quite, it's an open-ended question for both of you. How does the level of, I hate to put it in such words, but how does the level of suf suffering in both cases allow people the ability to relate in their own lives? And how do you try and portray the fact that we all have some sort of situation and there's a level of humanity in all of us where these the petty differences that we, hate, that we feel politically and socially or whatever can be mitigated by what you personally have experienced or what you've seen have been experienced by? Well, I guess one thing that I was thinking during the introduction and that your question kind of brings up for me too is um, like the idea of um, um, suffering that's like fair or unfair and, that, and suffering that you can mitigate or not mitigate. So if you look at what happened to the, you know, we're sitting here talking on behalf of other people, right? I'm talking on behalf of Paul and you're talking on behalf of these two former prisoners. And um, Paul has this funny quote in uh, his writing where he said, you know, oftentimes, um, uh, you know, if I think about the question, why me? I don't really ask that question. I think the question would be more, why not me? And I think um, he didn't, a lot of people asked us, you know, do, don't you think it's so unfair um, that Paul got sick or that Paul died? And um, I think he and I kind of, um, and this isn't easy to do every day, but in general, the idea of fairness is sort of like perpendicular to that concept of health or mortality or whatever. It's just like you have a human mortal body and it's not fair or unfair, it just sort of is. Um, whereas, I think um, in the case of your book, what happened to those prisoners and the um, length of time before they had their trial and the degree of unjustness and even the fact of thinking about a human being like beating another human being, um, I think there's all these layers of suffering that those men went through that were not you know, necessary and that really truly do feel unfair and I think are unfair. So um, I think like the contrast of these two books sort of raises that question about um, how we can actually mitigate like these layers of suffering. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I was struck by some of the ways in which the, the, the stories sort of mirror each other. I mean, uh, you know, the, the idea of um, you know, the, their, their relationship with time, 
right? And the, and the idea that, you know, in some ways the uncertainty for Paul was, it was a good thing, right? It, it's, and, and the uncertainty for them was, was not, I mean, it, it's, you know, how many days of life do I have left versus how many days until I can, if ever, get my life back. Um, and, uh, and I think, I think something that both stories offer is, is sort of a roadmap to how to deal with, deal with is probably the wrong phrase, but, but how to respond to suffering. Um, and, and, and I do think there's, there is an aspect of, you, you were talking about the unfairness idea. I mean, I, I think there is this idea of, uh, how, could we, could we just simply not do this? Um, I mean, I, I think, I think if, if anyone could stop cancer, we would. Um, you know, I think, I wonder if we, if we could stop Guantanamo. You know, I don't need to compare them in any way. Uh, but just the idea that, uh, the, the, these, are, the, these things that we do to one another, um, and I don't know. I, I just thought I was struck in in reading when breath becomes air uh, by just the the grace with which Paul and, and you as well uh, handle the, that that suffering. Thank you both very much. Any other questions around here? Hi, I'm Julianne, and I'm a country day alum. Um, this is mainly for Dan, or Mr. Rowan, this feels weird. Um, were there ever any reparations paid to Lakhtar or Mustafa for the time that they spent in Guantanamo? Well, the, the answer until about a month ago uh, would have been no, uh, none whatsoever. Uh, the US government has not apologized to them, has not formally acknowledged any, any error. Um, but that's one of the things they say. If nothing else, they would just like the government to acknowledge the mistake. Um, but so no. But, but the reason I said until until a couple months ago is one of the things we did uh, when when this book came out uh, is is we also set up a GoFundMe uh, account uh, specifically called the the Reparations Fund for Lakhdar and Mustafa, where people who read the story and wanted could. Uh, I feel right now like like this question was a plant and it's allowing me to fundraise and I promise uh, that's not the case. Um, but the, the reason I mention it is um, that uh, a, a number of generous people, in, including our host tonight, um, have made contributions to that, uh, which enabled me just, just a week ago to send each man uh, close to 5,000 euros. Uh, which you know, it makes a real meaningful difference in their lives, uh, and so th that's something I'm really grateful for is, is being able to, to do that. As a follow up to that, um, what was it about this case in particular that the firm decided to take it pro bono, and are they doing additional cases like this for pro bono or either for profit? So the, there's an organization called Reprieve that. Sorry, puts detainees in, in con finds lawyers for detainees. And for this particular uh, group of men, they, uh, Reprieve, came to Wilmer Hale uh, and asked specifically Steve Oleski and Rob Kirsch if they would take on the case. And they talked about it and, and decided, yes, this is exactly why they became lawyers. They knew it would be hard, they knew it would be expensive, they knew it would be years of their lives. Uh, but it's it's why they became lawyers. You mentioned totally it was thirty five thousand hours worth of work that they've done. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if they if they had done the work for paying clients, they would have billed roughly seventeen and a half million dollars. Uh, and and to be clear, I mean, they're doing fine. I, I wouldn't worry okay. too. They're you know. But it was a significant investment of time and energy and. Uh, 
And I think they knew going in it was not going to be an easy case, but they also knew it was an important one. Um, and it would have been easy to look away, and, and they didn't. Uh, I'm really glad they didn't. I'm, I'm honored to know them. Thank you, Dan, very much. Um, so with that, at the end, um, we're going to have Paul's dad, uh, Paul Sr., give a few closing remarks, and we'll go from there. You know, um, people come to me all the time um, and say, you should be really proud of your son, Paul. Um, I tell them, um, proud of all my sons and given an opportunity I would rather have Paul alive as a plumber rather than a celebrity after his death. On the other hand, um, he was fun to have as a child. Um, when I was um, in my final year fellowship, I took a month off uh, with the excuse to prepare for my boards. But I bet the four weeks I spent playing with them as a baby. Um, my wife tells me all the time I never touched the books during those four weeks. Um, My reflection about it is, 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 in spite of everything, you know, we are talking about a lot of important things today. Um, I think the world is full of goodness. Um, I think what we ought to do, that's what I learned from my son's dad, is Today is extremely important for every one of us. How well and how meaningful are we going to make our life today? And even though sometimes it's pretty hard to enjoy it, I enjoy it as much as you can. And Paul was in ICU after a pretty disastrous chemotherapy and uh, for about 10 days or so um, I wasn't sure he was going to make it. Um, <clears throat> Lucy was fully pregnant. She could, could have popped Katie any, any minute. Um, so I think if I recall it correct, that she just went outside in ICCCU. Oh, I broke my water. But I don't think she did. <laughs> so uh, that's life. Um, as a physician, I knew what was going on, but as a father, I could never believe it was going on. I was saying to myself, oh, maybe it's disseminated TB or Coxley or something like that. So coming back to empathy and the physician's relationship to patients, um, I'm always late with my patients. So my staff one day came and said, Dr. K, if you stop be a thing with your patients, you'll be on my time. So I told them, you know, I do more good be a thing with them rather than putting a stent in them. <laughs> um, so, um, mortality, you know, Abdul Kwande's book, I think, was like John the Baptist before Christ kind of opened up Paul's book. Uh, to us and to everybody. Um, and Paul, in his uh, literary masterpiece, uh, touched the nerve of our very being and make us stop and think what it really means. Um, we still get people at random uh, communicate with us and 
Lucy takes the major portion of uh, keeping the message alive. But my thought is, is to each and every one of us is to, to make it this you are live today as if this is your last day because this is the day God has given me the best you could do. Um, on my behalf of my wife and my family, I thank uh, Dr. Das and all of you to be here. Um, we love each other and our love for each other is agape love, unconditional love. Thank you. Lucy, Dan, any closing remarks on your end? I am. Um, I appreciate everyone being here. Um, you know, I, I think that these are both stories that in some ways might be easier to look away from and, and I think um, I think it's important that we don't I, I think we will be better for it if we don't um, but I strongly suspect that Lucy's going to say something more eloquent <laughs> more um, profound most likely I was going to say cheers to that <laughs> Like I said, choose the At La Jolla Country Day. Our mission is to help our students and ourselves grow in our understanding of how and why to be good global citizens, to lead meaningful lives, and to make the world a better place. We are grateful to Paul and Lucy Kalanathi, Lakhtar Boumedien, and Mustafa A. Idir for sharing their powerful stories. We hope that all students and adults will pay attention. <laughs>